Good day, my name is John Steele from the University of New South Wales and this is the next in our little se sequence of videos on complex analysis. In today's uh, video I'm just going to solve a simple trigonometric equation here, finding all solutions of, in this case, sine z equals 2i over the complex numbers. Now, uh, in doing these things, we want you to do something a bit more than just say z is the inverse sine of 2i. We want you to write z in terms of something much simpler typically either logarithms or inverse hyperbolic functions over the real line and multiples of pi or pi on 2 depending on what you've got. Now I'm going to do this in two different ways. Uh, the first way is my personal preference um, because it really requires less memory uh, but I'll show you the second way as well which is again perfectly acceptable. So uh, the first way I want to do it essentially relies on us remembering the definition of sine and then solving uh, quadratic equation and taking a logarithm. So if you remember our definition, we have sine of z is e to the i z minus e to the minus i z over 2i and we're trying to find z such that that is exactly 2i. Well the point here, when I said solving the quadratic, this is in fact a quadratic equation. It's a quadratic equation for e to the i z. So if we cross multiply 2i and then multiply through by e to the i z, what we get is, well that's going to become a minus 4. We're going to get e to the i z squared, uh, and it'll be plus 4 e to the i z minus 1 equals 0, which you can see is a quadratic equation in e to the i z. Now you can solve that using the quadratic formula, or you could complete the square, you get the same result either way. Given I've got a 4 here, I'm going to actually complete the square. So this is telling me that e to the i z plus 2 all squared will equal, well when you work out what it's got to be, you'll see it has to be so this tells us e to the i z plus 2 is plus or minus root 5 and we've got e to the i z. I'm going to do that next. So e to the i z is, well when we take the 2 over it's going to become minus 2 plus or minus the square root of 5. Now we have to find z from this, which is a matter of taking complex logarithms. It's something you have to know anyway. So, well, what we have to worry about is whether minus 2 plus or minus root 5 is positive or negative, because that will tell us something about its argument. And we're going to get two different cases here. i z is, well, if we take the plus sign here, minus 2 plus root 5 is positive. So we're going to get, remember the, log, the natural log of minus 2 plus root 5. Plus, well since this is positive, the argument must be an even multiple of pi. But in the negative case, minus 2 minus root 5 is of course negative. So we're going to get the log of minus 2 minus root 5 plus an odd multiple of pi. Now we can actually simplify this a little bit. I mean you could just divide through by z and state the answer and that would be perfectly okay. But we can in fact get something a little neater out of this because uh, minus 2 minus root 5 is 1 over minus 2 plus root 5. Well actually it's minus that. And if you're solving any of these trig equations where you're solving trig is real or pure imaginary, almost invariably that's what will happen. So we'll say note 1 over 2 plus root 5 is multiplied by appropriate conjugate third and we're going to get 2 minus root 5 divided by what's going to be 4 minus 5 which is minus 2 plus root 5. 
And so it follows that the log of 2 plus, one, uh, two plus root 5 is a negative of the log of minus 2 plus root 5. And since that's the one that's positive, that's the one we're going to concentrate on. So let me just write that down. Log of uh, 2 plus root 5 is a negative of the log of minus 2 plus root 5. So what have we got here? Uh, I'll leave the i in for the moment. i z is, well, let's use log of 2 plus root 5. plus some multiple of uh, pi i, an integer multiple of pi i. I should have pointed out that n is an integer up here. And so I'm going to write that as k pi i for k, an integer. And then I'm going to have to worry about, well, have I got a plus sign or a minus sign here? And it'll depend on what I've got. And if you think it through, I needed... Well, when I had log of 2 plus root 5, I had an odd power here. So if I've got an odd number k, I should have a um, positive sign here. So if I write that as minus 1 to the power of k, in fact, I want minus minus 1 to the power of k. And let's just check that that works out. All right, if k is then even, so we've got this upper solution, I would in fact have uh, minus log of 2 plus root 5, and that's correct from what I've got up there. Okay, now I've left the minus sign in there for a reason, because when I divide this through by i, which is the same as multiplying by minus i, it's going to disappear. So it'll look a little neater. So what have we got? We've got z is, and we'll put the real part first, of course, k pi plus it'll be i times minus 1 to the k log mod 2 plus root 5 for arbitrary integer k. OK, so that's the first way of doing it. It's my personal preference. Uh, because you get an answer out that's in terms simply of multiples of pi and a log. What I'm now going to do is show you the second way of doing it, in which case we're going to get an answer in terms of an inverse hyperbolic function. All right. So now let's look at the second method of solving this. And it relies on you remembering a formula for sine and z in terms of its really the imaginary parts. Now that's a formula I personally can never remember. I'm going to be able to write it up now because I've just had a, a, a look at what the formula is. So this is our alternative method. Sine of x plus i y is sine of x cos of y plus i uh, sine uh, no i cos of x sine of y, which is to be two i. And now we can compare really imaginary parts, and we get two equations. So let's put some English around this as that. What do we need? Well, our first equation says that sine x cos y is 0. And our second one says that cos x sine y is 2. So we'll call that one equation 1 and that one equation 2. And these are our two equations to be solved. So given these two equations, we, uh, well, we start with looking at equation 1 because we've got something equal to 0. Sine x cos y equals 0, so either sine x or cos y is 0. Well, x and y are both real, and cos of a real number is never 0, so this first equation tells me that sine must be 0. So let's write that down as cos y is not 0, 
equation one tells us, well, sine of x is zero, and sine is zero when x is a multiple of pi. So we know that x is n times pi. Now we can put this into equation two. We get cos of n pi times hyperbolic sine of y is equal to 2. Now, cos n pi is really just a, a fancy way of writing minus 1 to the n. So this is minus 1 to the n sine to y is 2. And since this is uh, minus 1 to the n here, we might as well move it over to the other side. Sine of y is twice minus 1 to the power of n. And so naturally we can now just take inverse hyperbolic sines of this, and y is inverse hyperbolic sine of twice minus 1 to the n. But the hyperbolic sine is an odd function, right? and therefore its inverse is. So uh, the inverse hyperbolic sine of 2 is just the inverse hyperbolic sine of 2, whatever that is, and the inverse hyperbolic sine of minus 2 is actually minus the inverse hyperbolic sine of 2. So we can actually just take the inverse hyperbolic sine of the 2. So y is minus 1 to the n sine inverse of 2. It's not that sine is linear, it's that it's odd that allows us to do that. Well, now we've finished, we just need to put everything together. So z is what was the real part n pi and what we got here i times minus 1 to the n inverse hyperbolic sine of 2 for of course n an integer. Now this in fact is exactly the same answer we got in the first method because the inverse hyperbolic sine of 2 is a log of 2 plus root 5. So we got the same answer out, but it's a little more obscure because we're using this inverse hyperbolic uh, sine function. It's not quite as obvious as the log is. Perfectly acceptable result, though. Uh, and, of course, it does, as I said earlier, rely on you remembering this formula for sine. All right? uh, and the similar ones for the cosine, the hyperbolic cosine and the hyperbolic sine, if that's what you're asked to solve. Whereas the other method relies on you just remembering the definitions of sine cos cosh and, co and sine, which you have to know anyway, uh, and then being able to take logs, which is something else we typically expect you to have to do. But in the end, whichever method you use is entirely up to you. We don't mind. Both answers are correct. Thank you.